Scripture for the message is Luke 8, verse 26 to 39. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, and he fell down before him. He said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times uh, it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds, be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. They begged him to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. The herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Then when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled. They towed it in the city and in the country. People went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Now those who had seen it told them how this demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away and said, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And so he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. When we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us with sighs too deep for words. This is Romans 8, 26. To me, this verse means that Jesus himself is there inside of us, and he's cleansing us from the inside out. The level that Jesus is working on is so deep, it's beyond our normal ways of expression. So that's why Paul had said that it's too deep for words. The way Jesus cleanses us, in other words, is beyond our normal way of understanding even what cleansing is. Normally, it's typical for us to just think that Jesus comes into our lives when we have a particular problem that we can recognize. Relationship problem, financial problem, health problem. We ask Jesus to come and fix that for us. And he does do those things. But when he does those things, those are signs. Constantly, even when we don't ask, and even when we're not aware, he's there deep inside of us, beyond our comprehension. And he's there inside of us, bringing about a deeper inner cleansing a greater cleansing than just these repairing of finances or health or relationships that we can see visibly. There's something much deeper that Jesus is always doing to bring about a greater cleansing. That's what our text, I think, lifts up for us as you might have found it to be a very strange text as you heard it. Jesus encounters a very unusual man in Gentile territory. He and the disciples have gone over to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And there meets him a demon-possessed man, naked, living among the tombs, because he can't live among people. He had been for a while among them, kept under guard, chained and shackled, but he would always break his bonds, and then he would flee into the wilderness. And yet this powerful man, when he encounters Jesus, we see that he's on his knees and begging, do not torture me. 
the many demons that are within him can't stand in Jesus' presence. And yet, as they say, they don't want to depart into the abyss. So they have a strange request. There was a large herd of pigs grazing near there, and they asked Jesus to permit them to enter the herd. Now, why in the world would they ask that? Well, pigs were unclean in Israel. This is Gentile territory on the other side of the lake. And yet now Israel's Messiah has come over to that side of the lake. And it seems that he doesn't want to allow demons to exist in a person anymore. So their request is almost like saying, well, you Israelites consider pigs unclean. And if we're unclean and can't abide in people, well, at least let us go into these unclean pigs because they're unclean just like us. And so, so it should be okay that, that we live there. And Jesus at first seems to grant permission for this to happen. And yet as the demons go out of the man and enter into the pigs, they rush down the, the steep bank and they all drown in the sea. What in the world is going on here? To me, this is a sign. It's a sign that Jesus is bringing about a life and a kingdom where there's no uncleanness at all. In eternity, there's not going to be some corner that's kept off to the side and said, okay, this is where evil can be. This is where uncleanness can be. In the eternal kingdom that Jesus brings in, everything is going to be holy, clean, pure. There won't be any shadow or darkness or evil in any way. In Israelite times, because it wasn't the eternal kingdom, there was a place for uncleanness. Uh, pigs were unclean. The wilderness was generally considered unclean. But, and so these demons keep, seem to be asking, can't we stay, live, continue to abide in a place that's unclean. But Jesus is doing a deeper cleansing. He's going to bring in a life and a kingdom where there's nothing unclean ever. And so when the demons enter those unclean pigs, they have to rush into the sea and drown as a sign that there's going to be no unclean place for evil to live. Now, this isn't understood at the time, of course. The herdsmen see this, and they flee. And on the way from the fields into the city, they're telling everybody what had happened. And so a big crowd comes out to see what's occurred. And it says that now they see the man clothed and sound-minded sitting at Jesus' feet. Now, notice these same crowd of people would have been very afraid of of this man before. That's why he was chained and shackled. And once he went out among the tombs, they stayed away from him. But it, oddly enough, they seem to be even more afraid of him now. At least we knew who this man was before. We didn't like it, but we knew who he was and there could be a place for him among the graveyard. Now they don't know what to make of him. He was this person. He's not like us. And yet he seems to be like us. So this scares them. And the person who made it, this man, so scares them even more. So it says that they were uh, being distressed with great fear. And they all, all as one, the whole crowd asked Jesus to leave. To depart from there. Now notice, isn't this what the demons were asking? You know, we can't stand in your presence. And now this is what these people are saying. They got used to having a certain amount of evil or darkness or uncleanness in their lives, their individual lives and their lives as a society. It doesn't make sense to them. It scares them to think about a life where everything is cleansed where everything is pure from the inside out, where nobody even ever wants to do anything wrong. 
but people always want to do what's good and loving towards God and each other. They don't understand this deeper cleansing that Jesus is bringing about, and so when he gives a sign of it, it scares them so much they say, we can't abide in your presence. Now the man who was cleansed outwardly, he does want to stay with him. But Jesus says, no, stay in this area, in your homeland, and go and tell everything that God has done for you. Jesus was working on a deeper level than anyone could understand. He was bringing a greater cleansing than just what could be seen on the outside. The man's cleansing was just a sign. It wasn't the deeper inner cleansing. Let's hear how a man named Victor Herbert has had an unusual episode that in his life that helped him to get just a little glimpse of this deeper cleansing. When he was 34, he said he had a mild case, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but, but Wilan Barr syndrome. It's a, a rare nerve illness. He said you experience numbness at first, and then paralysis. And the paralysis can even affect the inner organs. So he said, for example, if your lungs would become paralyzed, you were in danger of suffocating. But Victor's case was so brief and mild that even though the doctor warned him that it could possibly recur, he forgot about it for years. He said, I had a busy life, wife, four children, a job as a sales engineer. But 20 years later, when he was 54, he felt a tingling in his fingers when he woke up one day. His thighs felt heavy as he swung his legs over to the side of the bed. His knees buckled when he tried to stand. By the time he got to the hospital, his legs were numb. The next day, his stomach and bowels had stopped working because they also were paralyzed. He could feel the numbness moving up his chest. The day after that, it entered his lungs and throat. I was scared. I felt alone and helpless. And yet something happened at that moment that he couldn't explain. As I lay motionless, I felt something I'd never felt before. A calling out from deep inside me. A need that was as strong and real as hunger. I wanted God. I craved him. Years ago, Victor had been raised in the church, but he kind of gave all of that up as he grew up and he started to think, the only thing I can trust is science. I can only trust things I can explain. And so faith didn't seem to have any part of that. So he didn't understand what was happening to him now. But I think this is that first verse we started with where we said that when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us with sighs too deep for words. For notice he said that there was a calling out from deep inside him. Jesus, through the Spirit, was calling out and praying for him. Instead of merely wanting healing for himself in this prayer, because it's Jesus who always does things for others, he found that the prayer was to entrust his wife into God's care. At first, Victor said he started praying the few words he could remember from the Lord's Prayer, but he couldn't get all of them right because it had been so long since he had prayed it. But then at the end, he said, Please, Lord, take care of my wife Shirley when I go. Praying for others because Jesus always did things for others. After that prayer came out, he started gasping for breath. And then the next thing he knew, he woke up in the intensive care unit. Only my mind seemed to be functioning. My body felt mummified. I was paralyzed from the chin down. He knew there were IVs in him. He knew he was on a respirator, helping him to breathe. But 
he heard the doctor saying they were going to give some new experimental treatment, but that treatment unfortunately caused him to get pneumonia. So then they put him into one of those striker frames that, that turn and flip all the time, and he said that he was always seemed to be in motion. He felt like he was on a rotisserie or something because it seemed like he was turning all of the time. And yet with that turning, it was affecting his equilibrium. He was having a hard time distinguishing between reality and delusions. He would see shapes, a trash can or a shadow against the wall, and he would start suspecting it was something evil and nefarious. And so he was starting to develop a paranoia. Now, after Victor had prayed that first prayer with Jesus' help, he had been trying to pray continually. And so now, as this paranoia came in, he cried out inwardly, Please, Lord, show me how to stay with you. And as he prayed that prayer, and as his bed was turning, he caught a glimpse of a woman with a deep sadness on her face. He had seen her before. He knew she was the mother of the 16-year-old in the next bed. He had heard from whispers of relatives that they didn't expect this boy to be able to live. Suddenly, I wanted to comfort that mother. Involuntarily, notice again, the Spirit praying for us, involuntarily, in a rush of compassion, I prayed, a sad woman is here, Lord, who's so scared. Her son is nearly dead. Please, Lord, keep her in your loving care and wrap that boy in your healing spirit. Once the Spirit had prayed this prayer through him, he then repeated this prayer continually, day and night, for the boy and for the mother. Gradually, he said, over the next days, the whispers of the relatives started to sound a little less gloomy. One of the times when he was twisting and he saw, uh, got a glimpse of the mother's face, he could see a flicker of hope there. Eventually a doctor came in and said he would recover. The boy's life, Victor said, had become infinitely precious to me. Over time, not only did the boy recover and get to leave the hospital, but Victor himself left the intensive care unit and eventually recovered. A gift from God, he called it. And yet he didn't focus on his own healing. He never forgot that when he asked to stay in touch with God, that he pointed me to the face of another human. Jesus works on a level that's so deep, it's beyond our normal ways of expression. To even get a glimpse of his greater cleansing, we have to be led, like Victor, to pray for others, just as he did to first his wife, and then the 16-year-old and his mother. We don't even have to know how to pray because the Holy Spirit will pray for us with sighs too deep for words. This is all a sign of a greater cleansing that's occurring all the time because Jesus is here all the time cleansing each and every one of us.